Professor Cornell West, thank you so much for being with me. I'm so grateful. Well, I just want to begin by saluting you, my dear sister. You are one of the few in the higher echelons of public life and the public conversation who understand the intimate relation between the spiritual and the social, the personal and the political, and the existential and the economic. It's very rare that people have that synoptic vision and it connect the spiritual decay to the social misery the emptiness in high places, the challenge for those who are struggling economically so that spirituality, morality, integrity sit at the center and the beginning of any serious discussion about the relation of a self and a society. You want a few to do that, my dear sister, and I, I salute you for that. You've been consistent over the years, down through the decade. And as you know, you're much more ecumenical than I am. I'm much more just rooted in Jerusalem, Judaism, Christianity. But you come out of the Judaic Christian sensibility, but you embrace forms of spirituality that go far beyond what I tend to uh, be able to do. But it's still a distinctive calling that you have. And I well, appreciate that. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm honored by those words. And certainly you are one of the people that not only teaches me and how many millions of other people, but also keeps hope alive because it's one thing to learn these theories, to learn these ideas, to learn these principles from people who are no longer with us on this planet. But the fire is living, and you are one of those people that embodies. There's something about the embodiment of hope. Uh, I heard you say that hope is a verb. So it's what we can fuel now. Absolutely. And that matters to both of us. And I, I want to talk with you about the blocks to the emergence of the spiritual fire in a way that makes a political difference in America today. First of all, I think a lot of people, when we talk about morality, the way you and I talk about love concretize and resacralizing the world, I think a lot of people don't necessarily know what we're talking about, about bringing morality into politics. They don't necessarily know what we're talking about, about the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem. Could you tell us what that means? I'd like to begin with uh, my soulmate, my dear brother, the great Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. Uh, first essay he wrote in the English language, it was about his fourth language, he just got here in March of 1940, but he wrote an essay called What is Piety? And piety, of course, is the depth that we have for the forces of good in our lives from womb to tomb. The acknowledgement of the kind of love injections, the acknowledgement of the sources of empowerment and enablement, enablement in our lives. It could be our parents, our coaches, our friends, even our kids later on in life. So that when you talk about the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, you're really beginning with a note of gratitude. And gratitude is very important because it doesn't allow a whole lot of space of narcissism in the soul of gratitude is at the center of it. If you have a thank you, a thankfulness as your fundamental disposition toward the world, all the negativity in the world, yes, it's real, but there are sources that allow you to be thankful. So remembering the best, and of course the Hebrew scripture begins, remember when you were in Egypt and I delivered you. Remember when you were in trouble and your mama came in, in trouble and your friend intervened. So that when you think of a uh, prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, you re you're beginning with a deep sense of thankfulness and remembrance tied to reverence, something bigger than your ego. In the secular mode, it could be equality, democracy, freedom, self-realization. In religion, it could be God, it could be Yahweh, it could be uh, uh, Allah or whatever. Uh, for me, it's Jesus and, and, and God, the re reverence of something bigger than me. Now I come out of the black church, so it's the kingdom of God. And I'm told if the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you leave a little heaven behind. That's the way in which you enact and embody that reverence rooted on a re remembrance, but it results in resilience and resistance. And you got all three of those in that powerful essay by Heschel. That resilience and resistance tied to reverence, grounded in remembrance. And at the center of it, of course, is Hesed, is that steadfast love, that loving kindness to orphan, widow, fatherless, motherless, 
persecuted and subjugated. And that is the covenant made, right? Do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with thy God. It seems to me that where a lot of people forget is that they are grateful but it's not enough to be grateful that you escaped the land of Egypt. Mm. You must remember to be kind to the stranger today, for as I was once kind to you when you were in the land of Egypt. I find one of the problems in America today is how many people have escaped. Yes. But forget, it's not enough that you escaped. You have to help those who have not escaped. Absolutely. Not enough that you made it. And it's not enough that you're grateful that you made it. Isn't a way that we display and demonstrate our greatness is to remember not only that our ancestors yes. were enslaved in the land of Egypt, but that some people on the other side of town are right now. And don't tell me you thank me for rescuing you if you're not willing to rescue others who are bound today because it doesn't that go under the the, the signature of God shall not be mocked. He sees that for what it is, correct? Oh, no, that's a powerful point, my dear sister. And for me, you know, even given all, you know, genocide and so forth in Hebrew scripture, that the genius of Hebrew scripture is actually rooting that kind of universality that you talked about, the willingness to help others, what Dietrich Bonhoeffer called what it means to be for others. He called Jesus the man for others, that the whole tradition, Amos, Esther, Isaiah, and so forth, is this exactly what you, you acknowledge. It's the embrace of stranger, the love of neighbor. You get that in Leviticus 19. That's what Jesus is echoing, right? We got to remind our Christians, because the radical Jewishness of Jesus is often overlooked as Jesus is Europeanized and whitenized and so forth, grounded in that prophetic Judaism. But you're right, it's a universality but, but but immersed in a particularity, in a particular people, particular community, particular tradition, but it is for everybody. Amos says justice is for all of the nations, Israel, other nations across the board, each viewed equally, each viewed honestly, each viewed consistently, but the spiritual and the moral lens become the major lens through which you view the world. I mean, that's what, what separated you from the politicians was that it's so alien for any of our politicians to look at the world through moral and spiritual lens. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's so uh, uh, outside of their imagination in that way. And yet everybody knows that the realities are profoundly economic, political, social, and spiritual and moral. Let's talk about why that is. You and I are both old enough to remember William Sloan Coffin. The great Sloan we Coffin. We are both old enough to remember Martin Luther King Jr. As Abraham as Rabbi Heschel said, Martin Luther King is a sign that God has not forsaken the United States. <laughs> that's, that's so you and I grew up at a time when the spiritual and the political were aligned unabashedly on the left. What happened? Why did this transition occur into a almost fundamentalist materialism on the left that ironically sometimes makes it harder to speak to a left-wing audience than it is to speak to a right-wing audience about the place that God and the prophetic vision holds in politics? Number one, what happened? And number two, how do we realign them? How can we put them back? Mm -hmm. You know, you remind me of uh, William Sloan Coffin's uh, eulogy for Abraham Joshua Heschel. He couldn't give it, so he just handed the words to Sylvia's wife. He said, uh, I just loved him so. He was the kindest man that he was the most biblical man I ever met because his reverence for God was inseparable from an irreverence to any human institution, especially the state. You see, that he would always correct me with his prophetic mercy and his sense of humor. Now that's that's a wonderful relation between the Goyim and, and 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 a Jewish brother, right? That you get you get the Gentile and the Jew. Now what is it about Coffin? What is it about Hesher? What is it about Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin Luther King Jr.? Well one is that 
the secular left got so thoroughly professionalized and commodified that the best of secularity, and there is a best of secularity, it's a Socratic dimension, it's the critical thinking, it's the cutting against the grain, it's the suspicion of dogma and doctrine. That's Absolutely. where we get critiques of monarchy, white supremacy, male supremacy, predatory capitalism. Those are wonderful things. But when the dominant tendency of your secular uh, uh, left more and more is one of embracing status, spectacle, position, and then wanting to hold on to some progressive sensibilities as you're being professionalized and commodified, that you end up losing your spirituality. It gets flattened out and you more and more become subject to a kind of idolatry or at least a captivity. You're rendered captive by an idolatry and that idolatry is very much one of status and position. I love the comment that Coffin uh, made that real reverence to God I inherent there is an irreverence towards the state. Is, exactly. a, is a refusal to be that impressed by you because you have money. A refusal Absolutely. to be that impressed by you because you have this position, but you're an economist, you're a politician. It is, it is inherent there that I will not bow down to that because I bow down to God. It's, it's Jesus' attitude towards Caesar when they come up with the trick question. Absolutely. You want to know what is your relation to the worship of Caesar? Render what is Caesar's, render what is God. But God includes land, the people. The, <laughs> so you, you know that Caesar's going to be subordinate too. Every flag subordinate to something grander like a kingdom of God or love, beloved community or something grander than just what is in place at, the, at, at present. You're absolutely right. But I, but to me, Cornell, the, it, I understand why the neoliberals don't wish to allow a real moral dimension of conversation. I mean, they love to invite the heroes to come speak, but in terms of actually talking about economic policy, uh, uh, defense policy, uh, war and peace, uh, the, the, you can leave the room because you're just peripheral now. I'm talking about the rise of a progressive left that could really make a difference and the hope that I have that this attachment to a, to, a, to a strictly moralist analysis of history and economics, hopefully we can evolve beyond that. Because I felt when Trump was in, was in the presidency, I felt that he had ushered in an era of political theater, that we will not, will not be going away. And the only real antidote to the political theater that is produced by collectivized hate whether it's at Nuremberg, the, uh, the, the rallies at Nuremberg, or a rally at Charlottesville. The only way to counter that is through, is through a collectivization of the fire of the soul that I don't think can emerge from anywhere but, anywhere but a spiritual and prophetic vision. Absolutely. Now, Absolutely. But, it, it, but, but keep in mind, my dear sister, that even when you go beyond the, uh, uh, the milk toast centrist neoliberals, if you, if you look at even left, you know, my own left comrades, uh, so many of them are professionalized and bureaucratized in the universities, in the churches, in the synagogues, in the mosque, in the media, in the trade union movement. They're still bureaucratized and professionalized. They have their own pecking orders that are tied to status and the circulation of visibility and so on. So that it, it's a rare yeah. thing that they're able to really crack that in the way in which they like. Now we can tell a story about why that's true. And they are different than neoliberals. They got a critique of neoliberalism. Very You're right. Nice. But You're right, I've seen it. Kind, you know, I've seen more politics, politics than the... It's a highly professional critique, uh -huh. too often self, self, a self-indulgent critique, self-righteous uh -huh. critique. Yeah. See, the benchmarks of spirituality, the real fruits, not the foliage, the fruits of spirituality are what? Humility, tenacity, maturity, fallibility, openness, and that's where the arts come in, you see, because no matter how professionalized the arts are, you can professionalize jazz all you want, and they want, some of them want it because they need money, you, you, know, you can get money by means of professional uh, uh, credentializing and so forth, but the poets and the musicians, they know that if they don't have what you're talking about, they don't have that fire, that unapprehended inspiration that Shelley talks about at the end, right? 
that that sense of acknowledging you got a calling that's never reducible to your career you got a vocation not reducible to your profession you got something inside of you that's not reducible to your job then you've got the raw stuff for the social movements that we saw in the 60s that we associate with martin king and and fannie lou ham and dorothy day and heschel and so on does that, that we, does that make sense so my sister? of course and my question to you is do you feel that we can create that today Oh, absolutely. Oh, we got a young generation so hungry for. Yeah, I think they, so too. They, they just, they're so tired of the fakes yeah. and phonies and frauds. They're so tired of so the simulacra and the semblances, you know, of people acting, posing, posturing. And they're more and more just hungry for the real thing. And uh, uh, and that's, that, that is a sign of hope, but we got to acknowledge now. We're living in a deep moment of spiritual decay and moral decrepitude. And it cuts across color. Cuts across class, cuts across gender, cuts across sexual orientation, cuts across nations even. But the American empire in its particular moment now, of its decline and decay, uh, we have to be able to both tell the truth, but in telling the truth, we have to tease out the best. There's still, there's still the best in the American experiment. You see that the legacies of, of Emerson and Whitman and Melville, the legacies of the Louis Armstrongs and the Stephen Sondheims and the the Emily Dickinsons and others, it's not dead, it's just weak, it's just feeble. And that dichotomy has also always been with us. The greatness Absolutely. of the ideals, the greatness of the thinkers, the greatness of the artists, the greatness of, uh, the greatness of politicians has always been, and in every generation reiterates that Absolutely. struggle between forces of greed, forces of racism, forces of sadism, forces of empire that uh, are our mortal wounds, which takes us to the issue of race. One of the things that seems to me about Donald Trump is that he didn't just cause a wound to America, he revealed so many of the wounds, the underlying wounds of America. And one of the things that I've heard you talk about is how there will not be unity without repentance. And my question lies in how America, it seems to me, I, I, you know, Germany has paid $89 billion to Jewish organizations. That doesn't mean the Holocaust didn't happen, but I think that those reparations have gone far towards establishing an emotional and psychological reconciliation between Germany and the Jews of Europe that would not have happened otherwise. So it seems to me the question now is how we move from, I think we have enough Americans who are no longer in denial about the racism that is infused into our functioning. I think we have reached a point where enough people see it now. What are your thoughts about how we move the conversation now from recognition to genuine repentance and once again, because repentance is a spiritual movement within the heart, you can't have the political healing we need without that movement within the heart. We now have recognition. We need to move to repentance and then real restitution and reparations. Where, where do you see that going? How do you see it happening? Mm -hmm. Well, one, I do want to salute you being the only presidential candidate to hit reparations head on. I remember your powerful presentation there in October at Louisville with Sister Yvette Cornell and Brother Antonio Moore. You remember Brother Tone? I do. I saw you there. Hitting that head on. It took a lot of courage to do that because uh, reparations is a, a taboo issue. You know what I mean? It's almost like the Israeli occupation when it comes to foreign policy. Nobody wants to touch it. You say, no, we're going to hold on to our morality. We're going to hold on to our spirituality and talk about any issue in the world across the board and try not to fall into any of the xenophobic pits that's there. But, you know, I think in some ways it goes back to the blues question of Beethoven. You know, Beethoven used to say every morning I get up and look unflinchingly at the grimness and darkness of the world and still muster the courage to love the truth, to, to love beauty. And you say a nation has to do that, you see. You, can we look unflinchingly at what we did the indigenous peoples? Well, you see, in a minute, neoliberals want to say, well, uh, we know race is our original sin. Slavery is our original sin. No, no, slavery wasn't the original one. It was indigenous peoples. Don't exclude them because you want to look at America just as a democracy with a deficit. 
rather than an empire that took over land and people. So slavery was the second sin. So already, love the truth. You gotta love the truth. And Beethoven loved that truth in that music. He put his whole soul there. Very painful, very difficult. It's gonna be very painful America to look unflinchingly. And you said the same thing at the church there, St. Stephen's, with, with, with our dear brother, Reverend Crosby. You gotta look unflinchingly at the history. Who have we been at a nation? At our best, at our worst. At our best, here comes Elijah Lovejoy. There's Lydia Maria Chow. There's John Brown. These are white brothers and sisters doing what? Telling the truth about white supremacy, giving their lives. Then you got the black side. Well, you got a whole lot of like on the black side doing the same thing, but it's a moral spiritual issue. Here comes Jim Crow thereafter. But the first thing is coming to terms with indigenous peoples, genocidal effects, dispossession of land, American enterprise before it was a country, a corporation before it was a nation. That's not anti-American, that's the truth about America. But the best of America is, we got a whole host of fellow citizens of different colors and genders who tell the truth about that America and still hold on to our common humanity, hold on to our humane relations with one another. So yes, you have to acknowledge, then you have to, as you say, repent in the terms of acknowledge what has been done and where one has gone wrong without being trashed, without being disempowered, but acknowledge that grimness and then see how do you move forward in terms of some kind of repairing of the wrong. And reparations is just one particular way of repairing the wrong. It could be financial forms, it could be a cultural forms, educational forms, a lot of different ways, but you have to acknowledge some kind of damage has been done, some kind of repair must be put forward. You see? I'm sorry to go on and on like that. No, but that, that, the difference is to me the difference between race-based policies and reparations, because reparations carries that inherent mea culpa in a way that race-based policy doesn't. Race-based policies alone acknowledges the economic gap, but doesn't acknowledge how it got there. Mm -hmm. Doesn't acknowledge the wrong that was done. There's no inherent mea culpa. So once again, in order for the racial wounds to be healed, we have to include this moral and spiritual element. Absolutely, absolutely. And for me though, it's, again, it's just about truth and justice though, Sister Mary Ann, you know. And uh, the condition of truth is allow suffering to speak. And justice is a matter of fair treatment and making sure that justice not, uh, uh, doesn't snuff love out, you know, because any justice that's only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. You got to have deep love, care, and concern at the center of justice, or justice itself becomes an idol. That's part of the self-righteousness on behalf of a lot of my left com, too many of my left comrades. You see, they want to be on the justice train. You don't get on the love train. Because the love train means that you're not going to ever use justice. It's just a form of weaponizing your own identity and weaponizing your own status of being a do-gooder. Because it ain't about you. you it see, is about, so true. It's about giving to others. It's about sacrificing for others. You see, and the Hebrew scriptures talks about the, 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 uh, the, the, the attempt of spreading that hesed. That's not about weaponizing that to make you feel good about yourself. Esther's about to go under when she takes a stand, right? That's courage. That's taking a risk. That's putting something ahead of your own self so that the love and justice go hand in hand in that way. And, th and therefore, I think in the end, again, without that serious concern about truth and justice, race-based policy oftentimes becomes the policy for the middle classes. That's you forget right. about Jamal and Letitia in, in the hood, the, the poor and working class folk. When you see that over and over and over again, and yeah. what happens is what? Talk about progress for black people is measured by how many are successful, how many are making money. And you forget about the black masses catching hell, unemployed, unemployment and, and, and unbelievable love, decrepit education and not enough schools, not enough jobs with a living wage. And so, but it's the least of these, this is always the lens through which you view things, right? The least of these begins with the most vulnerable. Yeah, there are a lot of people who, who point to a Tyler Perry or an Oprah Winfrey or Magic Johnson and say, see, black people can make it. To That's say right. that a genius, and to be honest, that of itself is an improvement over what used to be, that sure. if you're a genius, 
no matter who you are, you have a good chance of making it in America. You shouldn't have to be a genius. Absolutely. You shouldn't have to be a genius to make it in America. Um, Absolutely. What in your mind, what is the main thing that white America, whether left or right, does not understand that we need to understand? I think that my beloved white brothers and sisters simply need to have different exemplars and different models from which they gain their inspiration, from which they measure themselves. Uh, that we live in a, a, a world in which the major models are highly successful money makers who are, live in a world of blitz and glitz and superficial uh, uh, conspicuous consumption. Uh, and, and they lose out on greatness. See, I believe William James talked about habitual vision of greatness. I believe that we ought to continually have our eyes on moral and spiritual greatness. And oftentimes that means you're not making a lot of money. It means you're not that popular. It means people are not patting you on the back. You're not the darling of the establishments. But greatness has to do with he or she who's the greatest among you will be your servant. What's the quality of your love? What's the depth of your compassion? What kind of risk are you willing to take? Or what the great Dietrich Bonhoeffer called the cost of discipleship. That's what and greatness of course, is. The cost for him, of course, was that he gave his life. You know, the thing trying for to me- kill a, Trying to kill a gangster named Hitler in the name of Jesus. Absolutely, okay. he's one of the great ones. I, you know, for me, and I, I think of myself as very, Socio-politically well-traveled, as I'm sure you are as well. We've been with the in the rooms with the very rich. We've been in the rooms with the very poor. And one of the things that blows my mind is not just that people look at the very rich and respect them more. That we understand what that kind of idolatry is about. Right. But that right. people right. look at the very rich and think they're smarter. Yeah, I know. That's the part that blows my mind. No, I, I don't think any socioeconomic group has a monopoly on morals, but neither does any socioeconomic group have a, uh, a, a monopoly on, on intelligence. No, it's on true. Nobility. But I think what happens, though, my dear sister, you know this wonderful book by Frederick DeBauer, The Cult of Smart, or our dear brother Michael Sandel, uh, Tyranny of Merit. Those are two books worth that uh, our, our, our audience ought to take a peek at. They're worth reading. But what has happened is, you know, what Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, well, we live in a culture now in which the 10th commandments mean little, it's the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. It's survival of the slickest. He or she who makes the biggest deal and is the slickest and therefore makes the most money must be smart. Exactly. See, so that, <laughs> it's, it's that it's that connection of just being slick. So in that sense, you know, the mafia has got to be the, the smartest of the smartest of the smartest. That's right. And, and more and more of our economic in, 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 in institutions are criminal in, enterprises. They big lawyers, how, how can I do this to break the law, get around the law, never get caught. Wall Street crime, 2008, massive insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent activity, predatory lending, never got caught. They must be very smart. No, they just didn't get caught. They're clever, they're slick. Can you imagine any society trying to sustain itself in a democratic mode in which the elevation of its heroes are the slickest and the most clever and the smartest in making money, the smartest in getting around the law, the smartest in manipulating others, the smartest in dominating others. That's a sick society. You know what that society calls those people today? The most qualified. Wow. Wow. The most qualified. Most, the qualified. most qualified. So the people who have become really, really good at playing the system that has driven us to the cliff. Exactly. The people who really know how to play the system that has driven us into the ditch are the only people we should consider qualified to leave us out, lead us out of the ditch. That's true. See, that's why the prophetic voices are very important. That's why your voice has been important. And the thing is, the prophetic voice can't be one that is looking for overnight success. It can't be one that thinks it's going to have some, uh, some potency or strength in a quick in a quick way, you know? It's keeping alive the best of a tradition that has been bequeathed to us. And sometimes in that very weakness, there is a power because it's able to subsist, it's able to survive. And when the crisis hits a certain moment, 
people have an openness to it. The Kairos. Okay, so let's talk about that. Um, Dr. <laughs> yeah, and Dr. King said there's redemptive power in unearned suffering. Oh, yes. So there's all this, this pressure cooker of unearned suffering. And you just keep pushing and you keep pushing. And I've heard you talk about that. You just keep, and, and hope is a verb, and you just keep pushing. That's right. And then when things go well, and if we are to survive, there's a Kairos moment. There's an yeah, opening. Absolutely. Are we there? We don't have too long to wait. You never know when Kairos moment really takes off. I mean, we have Kairos moments in our everyday lives in terms of those particular moments that hold off Kronos and and broaden the flatness of time into a meaning, meaningful moment and instant. But socially and historically, we just don't know. We have to acknowledge the mystery and unpredictability. We didn't know it with Emmett Till. We didn't know it with Floyd Jr. You know, you just don't know when it's going to take off. You just have to be ready. You have to always be prepared for it. But, let's, but I let's... think that there is an, there's, a, there's an awakening and the awakening sets the context and the atmosphere for a moment of kenosis, you see. And that awakening is something that we're forever cultivating, forever cultivating. It's like, remember the, you remember the epigraph the brothers carry miles off by the great Dostoevsky, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Plant those seeds and see if something got to die for it to, for, for, to, for, for it to come to life, but you just don't know. Barren oftentimes, oh, over here, this soil, my God, it's taking off. You just don't know. Is it gonna be in Mississippi? Well, it was with Emmett Till. Is it going to be in Minneapolis? Well, it was in Floyd Jr. Is it going to be in New York? We don't know. Eleanor Bumpers, never forget about her, but it didn't constitute the moment that that, 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 that Floyd's did. California, you don't know. Could be in, in, in South Africa. It could be in Ethiopia. Could be in wherever, West Bank or, 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 or Gaza. You just don't know. Because we don't, in, in the end, you know, we just don't have control of history. We got to acknowledge that, you know. We're, we're, we're just trying to serve before the worms get our bodies. I want to go a little deeper with that, if I might. Sure, sure. I think there is something here about what we do have control over. Mm. On one hand, there are those miracle moments in what sociology calls the local discontinuity of history, where why did it happen in that place? Why was there a genius right. cluster in that place? There is a there is a global rise of right wing authoritarianism right now. Oh, and neo fascism. Oh, yeah. absolutely. But there is also, and including in the United States, but there is also a global rise of these miraculous openings, Absolutely. these Kairos moments. Absolutely. But, and, and one of the things that's known about these Kairos moments is where history meets the man or woman who appears. Bernice King talks about the moment and her father, was it her father or was it the moment? And how did her father meet the moment and how did the moment create the father? But it <laughs> seems to me, Cornell, that this is not about one man or one woman, or it's not an age of soloists, it's an age of a song that is emerging. And when you talked about courage, it seems that people are still waiting for more data. The era of data collection is over. We, we know what, we, what is true, we know what we have to do. It seems to me that it's about all of us, what we do have control over is how devoted are you willing to be, how embarrassed by the system are you willing to be? How mocked by the system are you willing to be? How courageous are you willing to be to lay it all down in search of that which is beautiful before you die? Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that, that, that's it, though. That's, that's it. Uh, anybody who is willing to persists with integrity in the face of mockery and to persist with love in the face of being hated, persists with courage in the face of terror coming at you and persists with a sense of humor. You see, even Jesus doesn't have that. You know, we got to go to Shakespeare's Falstaff. We got to go to Mom's Mabley. We got to go to George Carlin. We got to go to Lenny Bruce. We got to go to Mark Twain, Ishmael Reed, and Nathaniel West. That sense of the comic, that again is much more associated with art than it is with religion. You see, religion is not known for generating the comic. 
No, and Heschel said, uh, synagogue is where prayers go to die. <laughs> so we, we, we got to get over the, the institutionalized religion. We, we get that. But I want to talk about the- But that armor you're talking about for the, uh, for the Carol's moment, which is going to be collective, it's going to be a cacophony of voices. It's going to be polyphony. We're not talking about one solo. You're absolutely right about that. And it's probably more disproportionately going to be led by women, uh, uh, given the- the, the openings for patriarchy that has been in place for thousands of years, you know, it's not because yeah. they're women. Okay, but let's let's go back to this a little bit because you keep saying how you see this you see this power uh, in music, you see this power in art, but we have to go back to it has to be in politics as well. And I heard you say, and I totally know it's true that if you try to take a moral vision into the political establishment, if you give in to the political establishment, your moral vision will be truncated. So the issue is, if you stay only outside electoral politics, and it seems to me, if you just look at American society, American society isn't the problem. The problem is that American politics is not where American society is, it's aligned with the regressive forces of attachment to money and power represented by the neoliberal establishment. And until we face the brokenness of our democracy that won't let the spirit in, the spirit, by the way, going back to what I said, I think the people on the right are as open to that as the people on the left could be. That is where mm -hmm. it feels to me that we are blocked. Mm -hmm. No, I, I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. I mean, you know, when Heschel says, well, you know, we, we're in a pit and a pit. Uh, all of us are down there. And it, it's, it's a matter of getting the souls out of the pit as well as the bodies out of the yeah. pit for overcoming poverty and having mm -hmm. and assets, quality education. And so it does cut across politics and ideology and, re and region. But at the same time, you know, I think the best you can do in electoral politics, you think of somebody like Brother Bernie or Sister Nina Turner, who I'm supporting, or a Corey Bush. Uh, 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 back in the day, you know, the Paul Wellstones, the Harold Washingtons. Right. You know, what they, they were statespersons rather than garden variety politicians. And a statesperson like a Lincoln, Lincoln's got Shakespeare in one pocket and he's got the Bible in another. He had one year formal education, right? So he, like every member of Congress has been to college. Lincoln never went to college. Compare them with him. It's a joke. Because two colleges went through Abe Lincoln, but he only went one year formally, you see. So he had an access to what the great artists have access to, which is vision, perseverance, endurance, integrity. And he wasn't perfect. I mean, he had white supremacist sensibilities and a whole lot of other things, but he grew. You he talked grew. about that, about his evolution. Absolutely, because that's the benchmark of greatness. You're in motion. Curtis Mayfield say, keep on pushing. What does that mean? You keep growing, you keep maturing, you keep expanding, you keep embracing. It's critical filtering. It's not an open mind and just open to everything. You filter that stuff, push out, make the distinction between the weed and the shaft in what's in your mind and in your soul. That's what the artists do for us. And the politicians are sensitive. They're attuned to that, you see. We just don't have enough. Why? Because big money snuffs them out. You know, big money snuffed out our brother Bernie. Big money snuffed you out. Big, big money snuffs out the visionaries. Now, Bernie is different than yourself because he's been an actual politician inside the system for all these years. I'm surprised he's still in his, his right mind. I used to tell him that all the time. I said, brother, I'm surprised you're still able to think. You know, well, I'll tell you, brother, I'm glad you're praying for me. I'm a Jewish atheistic brother, I but so a uh, secular with you. brother. But Such character. You know, it's very difficult in that way. And he's not the only one. I mean, you got Mark Ridley Thompson and other politicians, but it's a very small group because the you know, electoral political system these days is a site of legalized bribery and normalized corruption. And you get acculturated into it. You get accommodated. You can come in on fire. Yeah. It, and within a few they years, they get in there and they just get dejuiced. Their fingernails get they, they get all polite. So, <laughs> so, so you, you have said that we must not. You, I know these people. So, so we must not be. Um, you said, don't be surprised by evil, but don't be paralyzed by despair. Absolutely. And that's the moment we're in, isn't it?
Because I mean, it, by the evil, but no matter what we say about the politicians or the, you know, the greedy elites at the top, that they're human beings, they're made in the image of God. They're on the same human continuum as we are. They're wrestling with the same kind of demons that we are. They're just doing a, a less better job because they're more willing to worship a golden calf. And, and therefore you have to have this sense of uh, 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 fortitude along with a calm wisdom that goes hand in hand with your fury fire. If all you have is just fury fire and you're completely overwhelmed when you find out somebody's been lynched, somebody's been raped, you find out a people's been, uh, uh, it, it got genocide against them, you know, the police is killing so-and-so, your, your professor's lying on you, whatever it is, then you're still not ready because that is the way of the world that earth, wind and fire remind us, right? That's the way of the world. You got to be ready for that. You can't be surprised by that and overwhelmed and discombobulated by that. Oh my God, Trump is a neo-fascist gangster. You don't say Shocking. It. You don't say, you don't need to say it every day, every day. I oh, know. Yes. Now get I moving. Know. What, what you gonna do? And same is true for, for anybody. You know, you find out, you know, your best friend betrayed you. That's heavy and so forth. But they're human beings. You got the same capacity too. Work on it. I mean, you've been talking about this for decades, much more, more insight than me. So that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, it means don't be afraid of despair. I mean, Gerda used to say, he or she has never despaired, has never lived. That's a sign that you're alive, that you're wrestling with despair. That's what Jacob was wrestling with in the 32nd chapter of Genesis. But don't allow it to have the last word. That's true. I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the darkest elements of the neoliberal establishment is the is pathologizing human despair. Mm, now that's fascinating. Mm, don't it's, feel it's, that, honey. Yes, Let's it's, help it's, you it's numb everybody. that. Don't feel uh, that. And that uh, that is a problem. You see, that's a weakness you have. When in fact, it's a strength. Absolutely. It's like just like the brain. If you have a broken leg and the bone needs to be reset, the the brain feels pain otherwise you wouldn't know to reset the bone despair is psychic pain you've got to reset your thinking and you've got to reset your behavior and you've got to reset your civilization and if i didn't feel the pain how would i know to reset the bone if i didn't feel the despair how would i know to reset the world and it, it takes us back where we started with prophetic legacy jerusalem i mean one of the reasons why jewish brothers and sisters are world historical people in terms of their gifts to the world and they're human beings like everybody else, so they can be oppressive and dominating, but they've given these gifts to the world is to be able to hold on to the most intense forms of being hated and haunted and, 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 and devalued, viciously attacked, so that they are forever on intimate terms with some forms of despair and yet still are able to generate some sense of a possibility that is rooted in their sense of remembering, revering, and resisting. Now that's a spiritual matter. That's you a know spiritual what I think? Mm -hmm. In black people, that's where gospel music comes from. Absolutely. In Jewish people, that's where Jewish humor comes from. Mm. Now that's interesting. Now you mm -hmm. see, you got to get the blues in it because the gospels uh -huh. have a blues okay. element with that well, despair yeah. as well. You're absolutely right. Because but, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it, see, it's, I mean, both are tragic comic. Now, the, the most difficult thing, I've always argued that the, uh, the prophetic vocation, prophetic witness is cruciform in character and tragic comic in content. And what it means that if, 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 you, if you follow in Jesus into the temple, of course, temple is the largest edifice east of Rome with all the troops, 600 troops. You got the bankers there. You got the intellectuals there. You got the politicians there. He's running all of them out that he knows he's on the way to the cross. You see, when you love the poor that much that you're willing to be crucified and you're going to be crucified for what? Sedition, because that's what that was. It's a seditious act to overthrow those elites all intertwined. Hollywood, White House, Pentagon, Harvard, 
Yale, <laughs> Wall Street, all that together. But you're still loving them. You're not trashing them. You're not demonizing them. You're simply saying, you all ought to be ashamed of your greed, of your indifference, of your callousness toward these brothers and sisters out here, the poor whites in Appalachia, and these poor browns, and the poor indigenous, and the poor Asians, and these poor black folk, and these folk around the world with your militarism and all your bases and so forth. You ought to be ashamed. I'm going to remind you. Well, see, that's the cruciform. But it's tragic comic because just like a Chekhov short story, you still got a certain grin in the face of all the darkness. You get it with Isaac Babel as well. You get in in in, in Basheva Shink Singer as well. That tragic comic sense that keeps you going. That's that humor that you're talking about. See, now that humor is not in Hebrew scripture. No, not in Hebrew scripture. You got Isaac, which means laughter, but. That rich Jewish humor spills over far beyond the rabbis, far beyond the oh, synagogue. that's more of a modern, right, it, absolutely, it, as no, is no, gospel it, music. It's in everyday life. I mean, it's pre-modern, too. It's in everyday life of Jewish folk. But the elites are very suspicious of it because it, it, the, the it comic itself, itself. Right. It's, a, it's subversive of all institutions. Uh -huh. the comic, you know uh -huh. what I mean? It, it just is. I do. Richard Pryor and company, they, they, they coming at everybody because they coming at themselves too. My father used to say about race and the civil rights movement, he used to say about us as Jews, he said, just because they're not coming at us now, doesn't mean they won't be coming at us later. So always be on the side of whoever they're coming after. But that's, that's powerful. If you ever, if any people, whether it's blacks, Jews, or anyone else who has a historical right. legacy where our ancestors, whatever they did to your ancestors, it's in the psychic bloodstream. Don't go fooling yourself that it's gone just because it's asymptomatic at any given moment. That's exactly right. And the great thing about world historical peoples, the Persians, it can be a variety of we, different conceptions of what would mean by world historical, but for people who find themselves at the center of the historical stage and yet provide gifts that will enable the best in other peoples, even if it's not fully manifested in their own community, they've dished it out, they've unleashed it to people, you see. Yeah. That, that possibility is something that, you know, takes us to probably the ultimate question of our time is whether in fact human beings have a culti cultivated capacity to avoid self-destruction in light of ecological catastrophe. And that's an open question. It could be that we as species simply haven't cultivated capacities required to preserve our species. The greed is so overwhelming, we would rather have the whole species go under than for a small set of corporate elites who want to continue to get their profits tied to fossil fuel and so forth and don't care. You see, that's a deep moral and spiritual question. And that's why, you know, we, we got to be vigilant. Well, the collective behavioral patterns of humanity regarding uh, the environment, the earth, at this point, are maladaptive for our survival. Absolutely. And like any species, we will either evolve, we will either mutate, or we will go, <laughs> it's reasonable to assume we will go extinct. And yeah. I think, you know, going back to Heschel, he said, when I, was, when I was younger, I was most impressed by clever people. Now, as I age, I'm more impressed by kinder people. And what you were talking about earlier, clever people, clever people have not only kept us from the trajectory of self-destruction, they have in many ways been the top CEOs and fossil fuel companies, et cetera, that have led us there. That's so exactly. the evolutionary opening, the, the mutation is spiritual and moral. Absolutely. And one of the basic responses to those who are primarily for looking at the world through moral and spiritual lens is what? They're kooky. Oh, there's oh, just, they're so, know. They're, they're just so, uh, uh, they're, they're just kind of floating. You say, oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Read some Dostoevsky and see how much he floats. His but brother you know got what? so much spirituality and morality in him, more sense of reality because the, mor the moral and the spiritual is more real. As someone who has spent a year of my life unable to open my computer, unable to turn on television, unable to look a, at a website that someone wasn't calling me kooky. Mm. <laughs> and caricaturing my entire 37 year career. I tell you something, there's something about burning through that 
and knowing I'm still here. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you fall back though, my dear sister, on remembrance that you have touched people's hearts, minds, and souls in ways that they have been transformed and no one can steal that joy from you. No one can steal those realities from you. They may not be highly visible, but you know that the force for good that you have attempted to be has been able to touch those folk in that way. Now, all of us are finite, all of us are fall, fallible and so forth and so on. But you have to recall, I mean, they told John Coltrane, oh, you know, you're playing too fast. It's clear you don't know what you're doing on the horn. He didn't use them as a point of reference. He didn't even think about them. I'm doing what God called me to do. Here's my love supreme. You take it or leave it. I know it's not the best that I think I can do, but that's the best I could do right now. And I notice sometime in the club, folks say, ooh, train is touching me in a deep way. That's the point of reference. You see what I mean? That's the key. That's what That's what I'm up. learning. Absolutely. You know, first of all, right back at you in terms of the effects that you've had and the effect you do have. And I am one of those people that you lift up when I'm down. When you say things like, don't be, par don't be surprised by evil, but don't be paralyzed by despair. Yours is one of those voices that calls to me and says, don't you dare stay lying down. You already had your 15 minute nap. Get up, take a shower, get back out there. And if anybody is laying claim to the possibility of that Kairos moment, it is you. If anybody is standing in the space of possibility for all of us, it is you. And if anybody is answering a prophetic call and reaching with your call into the hearts and minds of millions and millions of people, it is you. I, you're one of the people, it's an honor to be on the planet at the same time. It's an honor to, especially because of what I said at the beginning of this conversation, it helps me that you're alive now. I'm inspired by so many people who are no longer here. Sometimes, can you just show me somebody who's alive right now? And God says, sure, cool now. <laughs> you so you so kind. Thank you, you so kind. Much. No, but we are in it together, my dear sister, and with many, many others, as yes, you we know. Are. Very much so. But thank you so much for allowing me to talk with you, be on the show, and continue to be inspired by what you have done and continue to do. And you just stay strong and straight out of Texas, straight <laughs> out of Houston, Texas. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's a deep thing. You well, know, Texas, there was a whole other side of Texas. You know, I grew up with the Texas of Ramsey Clark, the Texas of Barbara Jordan, the Texas of Jim Hightower. A lot of people have an image of Texas that's- We know my mother grew up in Orange, Texas. So we went back to Texas. Well, hello. My brother was born in Port Arthur, Texas. So when I think of Texas, I think of some high, high, high quality folk now. That's amazing. And you and I both have that bigness thing. <laughs> we really couldn't be subtle if we tried. <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> this, 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 we just, we're not, we're not based on people. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Professor Cornell West, Professor of Practical Philosophy at Harvard University. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, not only for being on the podcast with me, but for everything you do and everything you are. Much love to you. Thank you. No, so much. Love and respect you. Thank Thanks you.